Okay, so uh, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And today we have a guest. Is that my cue? That's your cue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Brad Frost. I am a uh, design system consultant and web developer based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this is, uh, I don't know how interesting this will be to anybody, but I think that this is uh, interesting for me, at least. I think this is the most geographically close episode I've ever done. <laughs> We're all within uh, uh, about two hours of each other, and Brad and I both live in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and I live in Cleveland, so I guess the two of you are supposed to gang up on me now? Or is- so it's interesting. I, I grew up here in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you grew up in Pittsburgh, Brad? I grew up north of Pittsburgh, a town called Oil City, Pennsylvania. So nice. more, more northwestern, northwestern, the birthplace of the oil industry, so... So uh, I I grew up here and then I moved away uh, like around middle school and I I was gone until about eight years ago uh, when I moved back. And um, one of the first things I did when I moved back here was uh, go to this event, uh, Abstractions. That was a a big uh, event that was here. And uh, I saw Brad there. And uh, at the time, we were working on web components. A lot of people wanted to talk to Brad after the event. And I was one of the people in in line trying to uh, talk to him because I was like, I think that Brad would be really interested in web components. It seems really related to his stuff. Uh, And it would be great to have some, you know, somebody like Brad's input on a lot of these things. So it's great to have you on the show and to have you here also to in part talk about web components. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, your instinct was right. <laughs> I would be interested in web components. So. <laughs> it, it seems really, really useful for the the sorts of things that you do. And also there's lots of things in web components that I think are are aimed to like help with some of the, the problems that you also have developed your own like ways to to look at it and to 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 solve over the years and i'm not sure we've always gotten them right (laughs) um it's very difficult without you know wide input from a lot of people and also just some time to live with it and understand what the pains are so i but by this i mean things like shadow dom and things like yeah happy to happy to get into to all of that i mean i so for the past Coming up on decade, I will say like closer to 10 years ago was like, a, hey, can you build us a responsive website? Now it's kind of the gig. Um, but over the course of the last decade, it's kind of morphed into, uh, hey, can you help us build and evolve our, our design systems, right? And, and so as such, we sort of duck our heads into all these big companies, uh, and and large co- or large and small, but but especially large companies, um, and so we get to see all manner of different sort of tech stacks and different you know sort of implementations of sort of front end code and stuff like that. We've built design systems, and you know, sort of uh, you know, seven eight years ago, they were it was more of a bootstrap style. Here's, you know, a front end specification and a CSS, you know, file that you can publish and, you know, match the classes and get it right. And then you get the, the, the desired look and feel. And then sort of the reacts of the world kind of came in, into the picture. And so learned react and learned angular and learned view and all of those things, just again, just whatever our clients are wielding and basically building these component libraries using these technologies that, you know, and these component libraries consist of your meat and potatoes UI components, right? The things that, you know, we all know and love your tabs and accordions and form fields and buttons and cards and heroes and, and all of that jazz. And across all of these different sort of tech stacks and implementations, it's, it's really the same same crap different day. <laughs> that's a, that's a, right. said very elegantly there, but but there's a lot of commonality, right? Um, at the implementation of what I kind of call this front of the front end code, meaning like the, the the markup, the styles, and the sort of presentational JavaScript. The, the 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 JavaScript required to you click on the accordion, it opens. You click on it again, and it closes. Right? That's that's kind of what we're talking about, and so. 
three and a half, four years ago, we finally had the opportunity to sort of build things in, in web components. And so it was at, at this stage, we had already sort of, you know, had a couple React-based libraries under our belts and, and a few other things. So it was kind of fun to, to take that into the world of web components. And um, yeah, for the past three and a half, four years, we've had a number of, of client engagements where we kind of come in do an assessment, sort of take a, a lay of the land of their sort of ecosystem and, and help make recommendations around how to tackle that ecosystem uh, with technology. And so as such, uh, we've been advocating for increasingly, not, not all the time, um, but increasingly looking to web components as a is a delivery vehicle for these design systems that are able to sort of travel to, you know, Angular apps and Vue apps and React apps, but also Drupal sites and WordPress sites and other sort of just things. And um, increasingly, that is that is the case, especially the the larger the company, right? The the more of a footprint and the more diversity of technology they have. So the more it kind of makes sense to just you know, and the, and the aim of design systems is we want to deliver these high quality, cohesive, good looking experiences to all of them, right? So our users don't care <laughs> if your marketing website is powered by WordPress and you log in and you hit a dashboard and that dashboard is built in React. Your users don't care about that, they, but they do see the buttons and they see the user interface and they want that experience to be uh cohesive right so so that's why increasingly we're like okay web components are a great way of solving that problem of well i don't want to have to code the the button css twice because we have a wordpress site and a react app <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so so that's the big wind up um, so that, that's what kind of like led us to, to web components. Uh, and, and yeah, it's been, it's been quite the ride. Yeah. So, uh, you recently wrote a blog post about this. In fact, let's talk about web components and, uh, it was, it was good. It was a good post to encourage everybody listening to, to go read about it. I, I think I, I also wrote, I've written several posts about different aspects of web components over the years. And like one of them also had to do with sort of like a lot of the controversies, which are, are like honestly still going on. Like people are like, web components are the best thing in the whole world. They will solve everything. And other people are like, what a bunch of garbage. <laughs> I think the truth is probably somewhere in between those two extremes. Of course. Like most things in life. <laughs> like most things in life, right. Um that it has some rough edges and there are some places where it's really, really, really good. And I think that the, the two benefits to custom elements really the, like the primary ones are that, um, first they exist, um, which sounds kind of a, a silly thing to say, but, um, people wanted custom elements in HTML about, 0.3 seconds after Tim announced HTML. <laughs> um, like, literally, this has been on the radar since the very, very early times. And we have had many attempts at this. And all of them spent years and ultimately did not get implemented in all the browsers. And this one did. So uh, that's not nothing, right? <laughs> I, re I remember when everyone was telling us that XML was going to solve this problem. It it is a really huge hurdle to overcome, and and web components, you know, made it. They they made it, but I think it also sort of a, that history matter. Unlike we'll say like the doc type curiosity that is more of just a historical footnote. Now I think that a lot of web components fits and starts in history plays into the current conversation around how people feel about things like web components because they've seen these different sort of generational efforts and these different sort of, you know, sort of manifestations of them over the years and seen the rough edges and seen and things kind of evolve. And, and it's just a fundamentally different beast than 
uh, a proprietary JavaScript framework or, or sort of something like that. It's, it's just this kind of platform level stuff, as you know, way better than I do, just needs to take a lot more into account and do more kind of consensus building and do more sort of things in the open that I think a lot of other places don't need to, to wrestle with. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a tension here where um, there will be fits and starts in anything. It, it's necessary growing pains. And a lot of this happen and, and people have uh, some impressions. So you're absolutely right about that. But also it means that like a lot of people will want different things. Sure. And like web components isn't currently, maybe it never will be, all of those things. We'll we'll have to see. We'll keep trying to get it to be what people need from it. But um, I, like I was saying, I think the big thing is that it exists. And even if it is useful for, let's say, you know, one out of 10 use cases. Better than zero. <laughs> well, that's that's huge, actually, because like given the size of the web, the diversity of the web, that is a huge, huge, huge number. So I, I think that the the capability and the potential is there for something to get really widely used. And maybe it's not super huge, but the other part about it that is really, I think, interesting is it it gives us a means to create s- slang for the web, right? So we have this dictionary of HTML elements, um, but we can say, you know, we can start using these new terms declaratively. And if they get really popular, it suddenly gets like potentially really easy to write them down because they're not bound up in some other framework or library. We can just look at what everybody is doing and say, gee, everybody thinks that this custom element is like the bee's knees, right? Right. So maybe maybe we should have an element like that. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of the SAS pattern for CSS. Or yeah, preprocessors in general, where the the working group when it started had to just come up with things that they thought that web developers and authors would want. Now that like SAS is super popular, they're able to shift much more to a well. Lots of people use variables. We should probably yes. have a way to do that in native CSS. Well, lots of people mix colors with like dark, darken, or lighten, or tint, or whatever. We should probably have a way to do that. You know, lots of people. Uh, even you know, expanding a little more, you know, lots of people use JavaScript frameworks so they can have parent selectors. Maybe we should have a has yeah. pseudo class stuff like that. But the thing is, I think the I think the advantage of the SAS to CSS pattern is that there really are like one or two popular preprocessors for CSS. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like SAS less. There are large communities around those, and I'm not. Do you see communities forming around custom elements? Should be. There should be. So let me let me paint a picture here, if I may. Okay. Oh, please do. <laughs> be, our, be our Bob Ross. And 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 hard agree that I think that these things really are like the test kitchens for what ought to be in HTML proper. Like I mean, I so I duck my head into so many different organizations and I just, you know, at some point in time, it all just kind of blurs together. Right. But it really, it really does boil down to the same. Again, when we're talking about design systems, it's like between, you know, 50 and a hundred common fair components. Now, not all of those ought to be their own sort of custom elements. uh, Meaning like future HTML elements like i don't know if it's if it's valuable to have a card html element proper but at the same time i see all of this stuff and i'm just like my god the just sheer amount of human energy that's going into just creating and recreating and recreating and recreating and recreating this stuff again and again and again and again and i'm like you know, if I had my magic wand, like half of this stuff is at least half of this stuff is going to end up in HTML proper. And so I like that web web components is like kind of this like stepping stone or test kitchen or whatever, however we want to sort of frame that to to like a pathway to to making 
this stuff and getting this stuff into HTML proper and, and like looking at the work and, and, you know, Brian, I know you're involved in this as like the open UI stuff, which I'm on the outside of, but it's like, I'm, I'm aware of this work uh, to sort of like take these kind of common patterns and try to like, you know, put pen to paper to sort of get them into more of a state where it can hopefully be implemented in the browser because I, let's just be frank. Like I, like, People shouldn't be creating their own custom date pickers. People shouldn't be creating their own UI widgets. People shouldn't be creating tabs and accordions. And accessibility, right? We like to just sort of pile on developers and, oh, 98% of websites are inaccessible and all this. Fix it. This is not, these are not unsolvable problems. And we should solve them at like lower levels so that like individuals can just kind of pick up the right thing and just get a bunch of stuff for free. <laughs> so it's like, I just see this, like I, what I feel is just like wasted human potential and wasted just sort of developer time multiplied thousands, if not millions of times all over the world, recreating the same freaking custom dropdown. And it's like, let's just, can we not? <laughs> Can we not do that? <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned OpenUI because uh, if, if you haven't seen it, I guess it was 2018 or 2019, you can look it up. Greg Whitworth and Nicole Sullivan gave a talk at a Chromium event, the Chrome Developer Summit, called uh, HTML Isn't Done. And uh, in it, they talked about OpenUI. And one of the things that OpenUI is trying to do is to be sort of that test kitchen for incubating the the ideas but even lower than that though is just this thing that brad is saying which is like wow there are i don't know roughly an infinite number of design systems and component libraries and um <clears throat> like they have so much in common but they also differ in like all all different kinds of ways like some amount of that commonality should not be just like start from scratch. Yes. So like, how can we sort of like catalog those things and like try to build some kind of uh, at least collaboration between uh, organizations that build those things and, and give them kind of a, a spec, like a minimal spec. That's like, this is what it means to be this. This is what you all have in common. And then here's a way that we could make it easier to, Extend that if you have the rare case where you need to go outside of that. And that is probably necessary because none of these things are fixed in in time, right? Like if you if I asked you way back in the like green screen <laughs> computer days about tabs, you might have seen some primitive ASCII tabs thing and you would be like, oh well, yeah, they're just like file folders they're like on the top but oh maybe lotus puts them on the bottom and they're actually kind of different things one of them is managing like almost independent files and the other is just managing sorts of sections of the same file uh and then you know microsoft came along and and said we're gonna put them on the side let the world burn <laughs> you know like <laughs> <laughs> and and but like they're not wrong right i mean like it, over the years these things like kind of change and like it today if you play video games you'll see like radial interfaces which are kind of like a bunch of them are effectively tabs and like it's okay like we can innovate uh we can change we just need to like find ways to say like that radial thing is is like tabs and here's like here's how it maps to those parts and like maybe most of the time that's just styling but all the parts should be the same and you should be able to explain it to your accessible interface and everything and you know like having some agreed like pattern or skeleton there that you that you start from that is sort of like the the unspoken the unwritten down not w3c standard but like sort of an industry agreement that we've collaborated would be a huge step. And I think, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. That, and, and I think that that, that really is just it. It's like it right now. And it's like, so, so much of, <laughs> so much of, of what the, the landscape is right now is a little bit of like a microcosm of what I see in my design system consulting work, 
So I'll go into a big old company with a bunch of different products and a bunch of different silos and a bunch of different scrum teams. And everybody's kind of got their headphones on, their horse blinders on, and they're all kind of, you know, inventing and reinventing their own sort of solutions. And they're and they're doing that not because they're they're trying to stick it to the man or anything like that, or because they think that their ideas are superior. It's really just like a lack of coordination and visibility <laughs> than anything else. And so it's like a lot of my job is to sort of like provide that visibility and provide that coordination. And like, here's what that looks like to all sort of be marching to the beat of the same drum and let's all do this and contribute to this stuff so that we're, again, sort of, putting our smart brains together to make this happen. And at an industry level, like the world over, it is in my view, just again, an utter and complete tragedy that we have all of these independent teams the world over creating and recreating and recreating things like tabs and accordions and and date pickers and, and what have you. And so that becomes the open question is like, yeah, what is that? Brian, that that like contract or that sort of specification or that just sort of shared thing that like everyone can just start like what does it look like to open the door to let's all just work on the same accordion pattern <laughs> so then so so we don't have to do our and and it's challenging because I, I can tell you that it's like with design systems like one of the big sort of like draws and the benefits is is that they are meant to be consistent within themselves so one of like the biggest things that we do and spend a lot of time on and have iterated over uh, a lot over the past again eight nine years is is API design, right? Like the actual words that we use for attributes. So we, you know, button, text equals click me, variant equals primary, size equals large, right? All of those things, all of those constructs are like super hard earned. And one of the sort of like benefits and one of the, the, the things that, that I'll, I will say is, is one of our sort of bits of secret sauce is that we help implement that stuff consistently when most of the time, whenever we look at an existing component library, developer one used text equals click me on this component, but developer two used label equals click me or whatever on a different component. And so there's just like some some of that, like just naming things stuff, which is uh, of course hard and, and hard to accomplish, but I, it's not insurmountable. It's not insurmountable. And I, I, I honestly don't know what it looks like to have like a global <laughs> component library, but like, Lord knows I want one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it is really weird. And I think a lot of this probably comes to the relative youth of the industry. I mean, we're, I know, Brad, that you do a fair amount of um, uh, like woodworking and that sort of thing. And Brian does that. I do that. And we're, web components and and stuff like that is kind of in the era of before standardized tools right where everybody has to make their own saw and everybody has to make their own chisel and their own whatever you know and and each person builds it a little differently like the your chiseling hammer you have to put together from wood and some people make it this way and some people make it this slightly different way and there are pos, you know pluses and minuses but you know now we're in a situ now we're in a in a in a area where you buy a chisel, right? Yeah, right, right. You, you can buy a chiseling hammer, and again, there are there are maybe different chiseling hammers for different needs, but they're standardized, and the web just isn't to that point yet. Really, no, that's, right. that's right, that's right. And I think I think it's important to paint that that vision. And this is, I I think why uh, this conversation, while. Uh, it's almost a little esoteric is, is ultimately like the, where my head is increasingly at, which is like, I am not particularly like interested in <laughs> the, building the best tabs component. Like I, <laughs> that has like lost its luster. And I'm now at a more existential place of like, what are we even doing here? <laughs> right. So yeah. I think it is important to sort of like paint this picture of it's like, yeah, like let's like go down the road 10 years and what does that standardization look like? What does 
uh, you know, HTML having a more comprehensive set of, of components look like. And sure, like Brian, to your point, that there's going to be new interface patterns that emerge and, and continue emerging. Like the world of user interfaces is only like freaking 50 years old or a little over 50 years old. So it's like, yeah, we got we got a ways to go for sure. But at the same time, it's like, I would love to see more of a a way, and, and this is just net new, like in the whole of human history, it's like, but the potential to actually harness the, the brain power and talents of a global community of developers to all be kind of orchestrated and sort of working on stuff and like making each other's stuff better. It's like, holy crap, right? Like there, there's the promise of the web right there. Mm. And right now it's just these like, it just feels so middle school and feels so juvenile when you just like see these different factions kind of meh, <laughs> like just kind of like, you know, clutching pearls and like, and, and sort of like, it, it is like total just schoolyard junk. And it's like, can we just not, can we just not, can we get to the part where we're actually like solving real things for, for like, the world and and actually trying to work together. (laughs) No, that's, I think like that's well stated in like every other uh, instances of can we all just work together? There seems to be a number of challenges with it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think like maybe we're young in this as, as a concept, but like, um, like we don't have a really good model for how standards should work. Actually, uh, I, I gave a, talk uh, a number of talks where i say there are a, an alarming number of standards bodies like um it, it, once you start learning about this stuff <laughs> and and like they do things like slightly differently and each one of them is also constantly changing but the the answer to the question why are there so many standards bodies and why do things keep changing is like we have no idea what the hell we're doing um and and you also wrote a a, a talk called i have no idea <laughs> what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. And, and, uh, I just went back and, and watched it again and it, it's a really, it's a really good talk. And I think like part of this has to be like, it's okay to a degree, but we should be trying to figure it out a little bit. That's, that's right. It's, 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 let's at least have the vision of, of uh, let's at least plant that flag out in the distance and, and start working towards it. And I think that that that's the issue, really, the world over, um, you know, sort of, you know, expand the circle to politics or whatever, things like that. It's like in absence of a shared vision. And this is why I think that that sort of values and principles are so incredibly important, because if we have a shared principle or a shared value in a we ought to be collaborating with one another we ought to be not reinventing um things just for the hell of it and get people to agree to that right wouldn't it be nice if we could all use the same accordion component for instance and to just get people going yeah that sounds good great okay now we have that sort of like flag in the in the distance that we could start working towards my frustration arises just in sort of witnessing conversations the world over is when there isn't that sense of shared purpose or values or 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 just objective, and and you, people are sort of preoccupied with the tactics or the implementation and all of that stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, eh, that's these things are beside the point. We ought to like, if we step back and just say like, what are we actually doing here? What are we like sort of working towards? And then get into tactics. And sure, there's going to be differences in tactics and implementations and standards and whatever. And that's totally fine. But let's at least have this sort of vision, right? <laughs> and agree yeah. to the vision. Because like some of these things is like, and I promise I won't get like totally into politics, but things like politics, the vision should be, we should make things better. Right. Do we agree with that? And I somehow doubt actually that there's a fair amount of people out there that would like disagree with that state. So it's like that's we'll we'll sort of like leave that as is. But it's like I I, th- I do think that we need to just like pull back a little bit and be like, what are we doing here? What are we working towards? And once we agree on that, 
which I think are pretty reasonable and agreeable type of values and principles, things like cooperation, things like sort of shared effort, things like not reinventing the wheel, things like trying to, to help each other, then the tactics become a little bit clearer and we're able to sort of align those tactics to the, the broader goals and vision. Yeah, I think I think the politics thing is is really interesting for two reasons. The first one is like it's a good illustration of of course we should I think there you would find generally agreement with the statement as stated, but you would find a broad amount of disagreement over what it means to be better. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, right. And so you have to like get increasingly careful about how you craft the thing that you're trying to get agreement on. The other part of this is like, like we just take, I don't know what it's like everywhere, but in the U S like you we run for office and uh, that costs a lot of money. Uh, it has a lot to do with letting people know what your policies are and who you are and why they should vote for you and why maybe your opponent is, uh, you know, a big liar. Uh, <laughs> that is very, very solvable if people would be involved, right? I mean, like the information is all there and we, you know, everybody could donate a little bit of time toward that or, or toward, you know, having those discussions with people and going out and knocking on doors or passing out flyers or whatever. But, um, in practice, it's like hard to get that level of participation really in, in a lot of times. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and that's where it really does come down to, you know, things like the, the people who do have the capabilities it, it, back to like the web world, it's like something like open UI or sort of something where there's like an apparatus or there's like an easy way to just kind of upvote a, a bug or like, yeah, do all of that stuff. It's like just to sort of really reduce the, the level of friction that it takes to sort of participate and stuff. And, and I think that, that that stuff is like really fascinating. Yeah, I had an idea a really long time ago, um, like 2014 or something. I tried to talk to uh, W3C, uh, uh, specifically the, the DevRel about it and um, get something set up. And in, in the end, Google had something that they were trying to do that was similar, but it kind of didn't go anywhere. But like today, I need an accordion for my website. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good luck. There's no wonder that people just create their own because like you you can have an absolute anxiety attack trying to find, like there's just so many, right? Yeah. And it's like, uh, well, okay, but this one doesn't work with my system or this one has, uh, like how do I even know if it's accessible? Like a lot of people want one because they don't want to, like they don't have the capability of knowing that themselves. I thought it would be great to have like a, a sort of like almost NPM, but not exactly NPM, but like some central place where you could register your web components. Yep. Um, but then on top of that, to have something like Underwriters Labs. Do you know Underwriters Labs? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, early in the electric industry, well, we wired houses for artificial lighting. <laughs> Like that was the whole, that was full stop, right? I mean, there were only the little screw in things in the wall. That That's all there was. Right. But then once we had that, like a whole bunch of people who are like us for the web, but for electricity, uh, were like, oh my God, I can do cool things. <laughs> and they built an entire industry of like toasters and refrigerators and all these things that would screw into light bulbs. And um all of these things like made the world dangerous in new ways that <laughs> nobody like not even insurance companies knew like how how do i evaluate this and, and so it started with an industry thing from insurance companies funding mm -hmm. the work but like the idea was like let's get somebody to say this one is good <laughs> Right, You know, like, let's get professionals to like actually review them and give us some advice. And that way you could say like, you know what I want? I just like, I want uh, an accordion that like five accessibility experts and some, some web components people all are like, yeah, on all levels, we think this is really good. And then you would not even think about it. You would just say. That's right. And it's because, it, because that's, that's the thing. The the whole throwing the baby out with the bathwater thing is the thing that just really grinds my gears the most, where it's just like, uh, 
and you have that happening millions of times over the, the world over. And it's like, let's just be like accordion. Let's just pick one and roll with it. And like, if there's deficiencies in it, if there's bugs, then let's like fix those and <laughs> I'll be better off for it, right? So. I mean, it's not good on either side of this, right? So like, if you are people who do accessibility reviews for a living, it's not like there's 10, right? There's right. an infinite number of them. And so like, it gets really exhausting to be like, oh my goodness, like literally my career could be like the accordion bug opener. <laughs> Um, and, and so it's no wonder that sometimes, you know, things get like terse and, and there's a, sure. a level of exhaustion there. Um, Jadedness, yeah, it's a, I, I fully understand it, but it's at the same time, it, it, it and, the, and this is where I think that your idea of having this like kind of more like kind of officially blessed where it's like, let's, let's like at least be like, this is the one that we're all going to rally around. And, and I'll use an example. So it's like for our React projects, React Date Picker is Airbnb's Date Picker. And it's it became the one, right? So if we're working, if we're building uh, React-based design systems, which we do, uh, and we need a Date Picker component, which we often do, guess what we're using? We're using React Date Picker. It's, it's the thing that won. It just like had the most gravity. And there are other ones that are out there, but this one is pretty damn good, right? And it, and it, everyone in that community seems to understand and acknowledge that, right? And so it would be cool to have like a, here is the thing, right? Here is the accordions and the tabs and the, you know, Date Picker and the, um, you know, sort of just, whatever components um that we need to say even things like badges or whatever it's like we can we can do those things and hold them up under sort of like an official structure and if people don't like them or if they're not you know sort of efficient uh or or they they have deficiencies or bugs that they aren't aren't as accessible as they ought to be or whatever but we, we just file issues and fix the things, but we're like all kind of like working along the same grain. Right? We're, we're, we're working to make the thing better rather than going up. Oh, see, there's one little tiny deficiency. So therefore I need to sort of peel off and, and do my own thing and go rogue. Yeah. Which, which then your rogue thing will have its own, <laughs> it's unique issues and and it happens all the time i i mean i could tell you so much where it's just the custom drop down so native select versus custom drop down is just such a brilliant example of this but i need it to also show this little red dot next to the text label and therefore we need to throw that native select control with all of its keyboard navigability with all of its accessibility features baked in. We're going to throw all of that in the trash can because I need to put a red dot next to that option. And, and that's literally it. I mean, and then what you have to do is then incur all of that work that you get for free. If you were to just use the native control and it's like, I see this happen again and again and again and again. And you're just like, oh. And and I think the big part of that is that the all the work is hidden from you in the native thing. And that that's good, right? Like it's it's actually really good that it's all you don't need to know all that. You just need to know like, oh, select. That's all that's all you really need to know. And like as an example, like a button. It's like so simple. Like just you put a button in your page and there you go. But like I've seen Leonie Watson give like a 45 minute talk about like, let's make a custom button <laughs> and let's do all of the things that are necessary to make this almost an exact equivalent of a native button. And it's like a lot, right? Uh, you don't have to know all that stuff when you use a, just a regular button. So that's what we want to get to is it's just, again, like, how do we make the right thing the easy thing, right? How do you make the thing where just by using the right tag? Yeah. It, you just you just get the goodness out of the box, and yeah, I don't know. Absolutely, make the make the right thing the easy thing, and make the wrong thing the difficult thing. Yeah. Is, I learned that from Kathy Sierra. Basically, she's like, she's like, this is a principle of horse training. 
And it's also a good design principle. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And, and it's, I feel like that's one of the, in, in my design systems work, it's one of the most like universal kind of principles. So it's like, this is how to make this, this successful is, is you just pick it up, you get the stuff for free and you sort of, you, you go with it. There's, there's another interesting, I think, sort of thing to learn. I think the, the React community has kind of gone in this sort of direction of, um, uh, there's this emergence of, of what's kind of called like headless UI stuff, which is basically here are these components and you kind of like bring your own, but it's one of the sort of fascinating phenomenons I think is that a component's behavior and style or semantics behavior, but also the visual style travel together which on one hand is is very welcome, but on the other hand, it's not, <laughs> especially the visual uh, sort of language, the design language part of it. That's why I think like material design is such a double-edged sword because it's like, oh, I am reaching for material design because I want tabs to work. But like my designers are, want to be able to design the tabs to look how they want to look like. I don't want this weird ripple effect when I click on the buttons, that's weird. I, I don't like that. And so that's where I think that this sort of trend in what I sort of see playing out in the React world, which is that uh, we're going to just kind of create these these kind of primitives or these like components that that take care of the nece- necessary sort of binding of, you know, whatever the ARIA stuff is sort of stitched together in the right way so that, you know, something is, you know, uh, ARIA expanded true or false. And like, it, it all just kind of works, right? But you bring your own presentational UI kind of to the party. And that's, a, I think, a really interesting thing and something that I I kind of would love to see at the at the kind of platform level as well, which is just like this, yeah, it's like... Eh, Rather than this, this kind of like, oh, it, it, it to to kind of like as much as humanly possible, like decouple the the aesthetic presentation of something with the sort of uh, semantics and accessibility and behavior of it. And if we were able to get that right, then that would be like super cool because that way people can style things to their heart's content, but like all of the necessary sort of accessibility stuff is just kind of baked in and you can trust that it's going to work. So, so those are, those are just like kind of like interesting trends that I sort of see playing out elsewhere that I'm like, I'm like, huh, that's an interesting opportunity, I think for kind of HTML level stuff, (laughs) which I guess I'm kind of describing like what, what HTML does in general, I guess, because like that, that is what it's doing. But um, how do we sort of extend that further into things like web components, I guess? One of the interesting things that gets really challenging is that the more flexible and fluid we make these to presentation, like it's very hard to separate entirely semantics from the presentation. And so like uh, if you squint hard enough, uh, these two things look really similar but maybe they're actually really different. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it is, it is challenging. And I, Dave Rupert said it really well, where it's just like, like, cause what we want to do is like attack something from like a purely like semantic or HTML level thing. But it's like, as soon as something like needs to like sit beside the other thing, then you got to bring styling into it. And in, in, in that, everything goes off the rails. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like, <laughs> so it's like, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Are there any pain points that you think it would be really good priority for us to address and, and like maybe why with, with web components? And maybe as part of that, I would like to know your thoughts on declarative shadow DOM. I, I think right now, and, and I mentioned this in the article or in, in another one that I kind of like linked to, which is kind of the word is, is zeitgeist, right? Which is, which is like where everybody's at now, these JavaScript communities have like sort of like come full circle and are now like, Hey, we should send HTML over the pipes, which translates to, okay, we want server side rendered experiences and so this is, becomes one of those oh, web components don't do that. And it's like, 
Well, they do, but also they don't. And it's, it's, it's complicated, but also I, and I didn't write this in my article. I don't think that a lot of people truly understand and what they actually mean by server side rendering. Like, I think that they just like see they're like treating it as this kind of like very coarse, you know, sort of just definition of, of something when in fact it is a lot more new and nuanced and gets into the magical world of, of progressive enhancement. So there is just, I think that uh, whole big ball of wax, which is to say server side rendering web components and making that work well. And the picture that I painted in the article is that it's like, we want the developer experience to be one of, I want to do my dash card and then pass in all the props, right? And and just have that experience, which is, uh, you know, we've come to know and love, right? Which is just, oh, I'm reaching for this. I need to splat a button on the page. I'm going to do my dash button and then sort of pass in the props and and move on to the next component and do the same thing. Like that is that is a great developer experience and it's one that that again sort of plays out syntactically different across React and Angular and Vue, but it's all effectively the same thing, right? So we want that experience as developers. But then we want the the browser experience, the actual thing that gets sort of rendered to the browser to be server side rendered and progressively enhanced and sort of elegant and and kind of work on page load, but then also sort of enhanced with superpowers once JavaScript becomes available, right? In that respect, you know, I look at something like declarative shadow DOM and I'm just kind of like, cool, I guess, if I don't have to think about it, that that's, that's how, that's how I see it is it's like, if that's the thing, if that's the shape that needs to take in order to, to unlock that good SSR progressive enhancement sort of strategy, plus the developer experience that we all want, I'm fine with it. I don't want to write that. That looks like garbage, right? So, so it looks bad and I wouldn't want to author it, but it's like, if that's the shape that it needs to take in order for it to work properly and that the machines can like sort of convert my stuff into that, then that's fine. Uh, that's, that's how I see that ball of wax. And I, I feel confident in sort of several conversations that I've been like having with different people, you know, Zach Leatherman, the lit, the lit core team, and just like kind of other people. There's a lot of smart brains working on this stuff. So I, I feel pretty good about that being not necessarily a solved problem, but at the same time, just like, I feel like this time next year, we'll have a lot more sort of mature solutions in there. Yeah, I don't know. I hope so. It's always tricky because any kind of engineering, there's like what you feel like you could, what you might want. And that is broad. And then there's a lot of steps to get there. And at some point you go, well, that that part is shippable all by itself, right? It's not the whole thing, but like, let's ship that part. And that happens in specs all the time. Like every CSS spec does that. But, you know, it's with Declarative Shadow DOM too, is that like, uh, I think that Declarative Shadow DOM is not what a lot of people are asking for. It is the sort of a minimally useful thing that I think you're right. Nobody wants to write that. (laughs) And it will be interesting to see how that, like how that plays into the conversations, whether people reject it because it's, like ugly, but also not really quite what they want yet, or whether we're able to wrap some things around that. And people like uh, Zach, for example, you know, show this can be really useful and it can be kind of hidden from you. And that's, here's this new, these new ideas. And those new ideas then will also then end up helping inform the the standard as it develops. So it's kind of, it's interesting. We'll see. Yeah, it is really like fascinating because it's like I just want to be like, yeah, my header. Here's the source to that HTML file, and just like work. <laughs> but then it does get complicated as soon as you're like, oh, okay, but yeah, like I do have some like JavaScript and stuff that like needs to be sort of rendered in there, and that's that's what I think is like really interesting because there's this like what I sort of wrote about in my article was it's like most web components don't need to be web components at all, right? What It's really just an abstraction for markup. And what I want to do is write product dash card 
title equals name of product, price equals this, image source, image alt, call to action, and, and just kind of like write that and have the right thing sort of render, right? The right markup mm-hmm. render. Like that's, there's no JavaScript involved, anything like that. But what happens? So, so what we want is basically mm-hmm. to just kind of do your old school, you know, whatever PHP includes or handlebars or mustache or any of those templating language. You just kind of want to be like, take this web component shape and convert that into just raw HTML. That's totally fine. But then it's like, it gets like weirdly complicated when you're like, okay, now all of a sudden I want that product card to be exactly the same way, but I also want there to be, I also want it to be dismissible, right? I want it to be, um, to render an X button in the top right corner of the product card uh, so that the user can sort of edit their cart or something like that and sort of remove this thing from from their, their shopping cart. And you're like, oh, okay. So now that JavaScript's involved, now it's like got to do like this, these different backflips. And it's just, it's really fascinating. But like at the end of the day, as developers, we want that sort of common developer experience, which is truthfully, I just don't care. I don't care how it works at the browser level. Like I, you guys <laughs> obviously care, <laughs> but I, I'm just kind of like a, So long as like we all just get to sort of like write things in this like kind of nice way and it just kind of ends up like working, then I'm fine. (laughs) Yeah, That's I'd say like the biggest sort of of say like front of mind topic. I think that there's sort of some other stuff around sort of shadow DOM that's really interesting. I'll say accessibility. So it's like I want to have like a label web component, right? That sort of bakes inside of it the required versus optional props. I want to sort of bake in the styling. I want to sort of like have all of this kind of just as a thing. Right now, you can't do that, right? Um, the, the, the shadow DOM is so like strict that I can't create like in a text field or a text input web component and a label component and then wrap both of those and into like a text field component and have the label be associated with the input. It's like, it's impossible to do that right now, which which feels gross. <laughs> Galia is actually working on that. Yeah, there we go. Well, thank you. <laughs> with some support from financial support from Salesforce. Great. Uh, great. So that's great. But, th- and that's what I see it as. It's like, it's like, these aren't, these aren't impossible problems. They just need solved. Right. And so thank yeah. you for, for helping solve them. But it's like, that's, that's the kind of things that I I get I get frustrated with that and, I, and Eric I know you've been in this dance for longer than I think any of us but it's like you just like see the things where it's just like the current solution is not exactly what we want yet and so people are dismissive of the entire project and that's just like a really exhausting thing to see I've now you know, been up whatever responsive images and just crap like that. (laughs) It's just like, just fix the problems. It's fine. It's fine. Sure. Grumble about it, complain about it, but let's direct it in a productive direction. We'll get them smoothed out. We'll get them shipped. And then we move on with our lives. (laughs) Eric, I, I, Eric's book is the second book I read as a web developer. So, so I knew that he's been around. <laughs> the first one was the cat in the hat and then yeah. <laughs> then directly into the CSS Bible. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of my age. You kids today <laughs> with your shadow dom and your... <laughs> you kids get off my dom. <laughs> That's pretty good. You should tweet that one. Thanks, Brad, for coming on. This is yeah, and Brad, where can people find you on the intertubes? Yeah, uh, it's um, bradfrost.com. That's where I, I blog my thoughts. It felt good to finally get a good meaty blog post out the door for uh, had a lot of life getting in the way of, of my mm. blog post. But yeah, so Brad Frost is, is my, my home base. And then my, my drug of choice is still Twitter. So I'm Brad underscore Frost uh, on Twitter where I uh, share web things as well as not web things. <laughs> and I apologize for the not web things. No, 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 no. No apologies. 
All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for, for having me. This has been great. And um, I enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.